This talk, can you hear me okay? Um, this is about F-Droid. Um, Peter is going to talk about an alternative app store that is private and secure, which is a novel concept in the sense that there are in a world of unsecure app stores, apps being slipped under the radar, hostile things, and mobile phones being the most common thing around. It's a genuine threat to people, so uh, he's doing some good work. Listen up. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, mate. Um, all right. Thank you all for coming uh, to hear about Android. I think it's really important that we do talk about Android at conferences like this because it's a Linux conference and Android is this thing that has been deployed on millions upon perhaps even billions of devices around the world. So I think it's good that there's a lot of people that are interested in hearing about this uh, and focusing on, on this, these sort of problems. Um, so I got interested in Android as, because it was the first smart device I ever owned. Um, I didn't have a Newton, I didn't have a Palm Oz, I was probably a bit too young for that. I didn't have a Windows CE device. But the reason that I got an Android device was because I was just starting to form an opinion on free software and Linux and I thought this is going to be really cool to have a smartphone operating system that is well supported, backed by big organisations, so it's going to continue being developed, and there's a large group of vendors who are willing to put it on their devices. So the Open Handset Alliance is a group of multiple different vendors um, who sort of signed up for this Android thing. Um, so yes, we've got this cool system that's going to hang around for a while, uh, and it's going to be just like Linux, except it's not that Linux experience that you're used to. Right? When you have GNU Linux on your desktop or your laptop, you don't get something like this, where the first thing that happens when you turn on your phone is to sign up, agree to some terms of service, and carry on. You can skip it. They've put a nice little skip button over there. But if you do that, you can't install any apps anymore. The Google Play Store won't work, and your smartphone just got a whole lot dumber. Now it's just a phone with maybe a web browser, and that's it. And you wouldn't accept this. I mean, if you installed Debian, and then Debian said something along those lines, you would think, this, what, what's going on? I don't trust this operating system. We're not familiar with this type of environment, right? So would you do that? Probably not. Um, there's a very good reason that, uh, they force you, that you're asked to sign up to the App Store every single time you get a new Android phone from your provider, and that is due to licensing. So Jonathan talked about this in his kernel talk uh, briefly uh, yesterday. And the idea is that if you want to um, distribute as a vendor, if you want to distribute an Android phone, you need to do it the Google way. You need to install the Google Play Store, the Google Play services, and so on. Right? So you have this Google Android experience. It's not an Android experience. And that's not what I'm particularly interested in. Right? So for this talk, I'm not actually going to be talking about this Google Android experience. I want you to sort of forget about that and we'll start thinking about something different. And what I want you to think about is the Android Open Source Project. And for those unfamiliar, the Android Open Source Project is that free system that I was hoping for. It's a set of components that is released by Google um, every time they release a new uh, version. And notably, it includes a Linux kernel, but also a bunch of uh, more user space related things. And I'll go into this in a, de in a bit more detail. but. They did also release things like phones and uh, phone software and messaging software, but they decided that you don't actually need that for a smartphone. So that's been removed. And the Google Android, sorry, the Android Open Source Project is essentially this. And one of the really important things for me as an application developer who cares about freedom um, and people using my applications as well is that there's this framework at the top. And what that means is that um, if you write an app for a mobile device, you want it to work on as many devices as possible. You don't want to have to write the same app three different times or ten different times. So people who write apps for the Google, Play, uh, for the Google Android experience, they're writing apps for the Android Open Source project as well. right? So if you want to create your own operating system based on the Android Open Source project, you get to leverage all of that developer mindshare and all of that work that other developers have put in. So you're, not, you're sort of hitting the ground running, so to speak. Um, and this sort of came, uh, was the starting point for a vibrant, vibrant ROM community. So ROM being someone says, I'm fed up with the Google experience. I'm going to take the Android open source project. I'm going to package it up with my own personal sort of slant. So maybe I'm interested in supporting older devices. Maybe I'm interested in security. Maybe I'm interested in customizing my device a bit more than what's allowed otherwise. Um, and it's really, really nice community, right? Except for anyone who's ever installed a custom ROM, does this look familiar? Has anyone installed a custom ROM on their Android phone before? Yeah, cool. That's actually most people here. Um, so this here is the XDA forums, and this is typically where you used to get your ROMs from. You'd come to this website, and they'd yell at you in red text with some underlined and some not underlined, 
and then they would send you off to some weird file sharing service to say download this arbitrary binary and install it on this machine that you're going to carry with you everywhere. Uh, and it's all a little bit scary um, doing that. It's not, I mean, that still exists, but it's actually, there's a lot more formal uh, projects now based around uh, open ROMs for Android. And it's quite nice to see, it's quite heartening to see that there's these well-organized communities, they have good documentation and good support, um, and they end up sort of working as more like an Android distribution that we know of. Okay, it's more like a Debian or a uh, Ubuntu or some sort of base distribution that then people can leverage. So Linear JAWS uh, cares a lot about supporting many devices. Replicant cares a lot about freedom, so they pull out all the binary drivers and then replace them with source, uh, ones written from source. And Copperhead focuses a lot on security. And there's a bunch of other communities as well, um, but they're just a, a small selection of these really well-run Android ROM projects that do care about freedom, and they do care about that Linux experience that you get on a typical machine. Right. Um, but the problem is, no matter how good those communities are run, you still need to get software on your phone. Okay? So once you've got your nice operating system that you're much happier with how it works, you're happier that you didn't have to sign up for Google when you first turned your phone on, um, then you ask, how do I get apps on my phone? And inevitably, someone says, I want the Google Play Store. So they go and they search, how do I install the Play Store on Linear JAWS, or how do I install the Play Store somewhere else? And the answer is, you find somebody who's ripped the binaries from a stock version of Android, zip them up, and then you download them from an equally distrusting file share hosting site, and you flash them to your device. So you're literally forced to, well, not forced, I mean, but a lot of people uh, end up pirating this software, essentially, because you don't have a license to use that software, you're not using the Google Android experience, and you're taking software from an untrusted host and then installing it in a very important part of your system. Okay? It's a little bit scary. And this is where F-Droid comes in. So F-Droid is an alternative to this sort of App Store experience. It's an alternative to Google Play. Um, by the fact that so many of you put your hand up saying you've installed a custom ROM, I'm guessing you're all familiar with the fact that there is lots of different App Stores on uh, Android that uh, run in Android. Uh, it's a little different from the Apple world where they try and lock down to just the App Store and you can only use the App Store. One of the most famous ones is probably Amazon, just because of the sheer amount of money they have to put into this. They don't sell the Google experience, they sell the Amazon experience. So they're not selling you an Android device. I think it's a Kindle Fire device. Um, and instead of Google Play, it comes with the Amazon App Store. Uh, but there's actually a multitude of other App Stores that you may not have ever heard of, and they normally spring up out of necessity. So in particular in China, where they block access to the App Store, the government will block access. There's quite a lot of different uh, App Stores that spring up. Um, in Vietnam, they have someone's come up with their own App Store. Aptoid is what Aptoid is originally forked from, and they've sort of diverged from freedom to not so freedom. And then we have Cafe Bazaar, which is an Iranian uh, app store, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on, right? So there's lots of these app stores around, um, and f is just one of these. Uh, and hopefully we think that it's a better version of it. So when I talk to most people now, I say f is an app store. It's a phrase that sort of entered the common, uh, common language. People understand what an app store is. It's a place you go to get apps on your smartphone. Um, so it does all the stuff, if you're not familiar with f I'll just give a quick tour. Um, it allows you to search and browse for apps and get notified of updates and so on. So you install this app store called f on your phone and you can browse through apps, you can search apps, uh, all the searching is done offline which is kind of nice. Um, you can browse by categories, you can search categories, uh, you can view details of the app and upgrade apps and uh, what you'll notice here is we publish old versions of applications as well so if there's a bug in the new version that makes it not work on your particular device. You can go back and install a previous version if you want, or if your um, system is no longer supported, you can also do that, which is also important. Get notified of updates. So most modern app stores, you want to get told when there's updates available and hopefully they start downloading. It's a little buggy still, but hopefully it'll get ironed out soon. And we do some other stuff that most app stores don't do. So this here is a feature we built in where you can take your device and turn it into a little mini app store. So you open f -Droid, and you select a bunch of apps that you want to um, share with other people around you, and then you use Bluetooth or wireless access points to share those apps in this sort of app store environment. Right? And it sounds a little gimmicky, um, but in places that have really poor internet connectivity, it's really, really important. Right? I'm not talking about my place east of Melbourne that has like one megabit. I'm talking about 
rural Vietnam, where it's prohibitively expensive to get internet access, or Cuba, where 20% of the people have access to the internet, it's really important that you facilitate the safe sharing of applications around in that environment. Right? Otherwise, people resort to Bluetoothing one version of an application to somebody, and then they never get another version of it. They never get any updates um, and security problems, and you get rogue apps getting installed around as well. Um, so here's just a sort of brief picture of the ecosystem. You have your phone in the center, um, and you can still have the Play Store on your phone if you have F-Droid. Um, and I would encourage you, if you haven't used F-Droid before, don't drop the Play Store completely. Otherwise, you might be horrified at the amount of stuff you're missing out on. But keep the Play Store, install F-Droid, and then F-Droid will be able to pull applications from these different repositories, including the official F-Droid repository, where we have only open source apps. But anyone can have their own repository, right? So it's kind of a nice model. Um, the theme of this conference is, is history repeating, and this sort of model isn't new. This is what a package manager does. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from this conference, it's F-Droid is a package manager for Android. All right? We're familiar with apt, we're familiar with yum, and those sort of package managers. Um, and F-Droid is not just the app that sits on your phone, but it's a whole ecosystem that goes behind that. Right? So we build packages from source, we sign them, you don't need an account to download packages because, again, when you use Debian, never once were you asked to sign up before you downloaded anything. We don't track people. Um, we don't care what you install on your phone. It's none of our business, just like we don't care what you install on your computer, unless you want popcorn or something to keep track of the most popular packages. No advertising within the App Store. A lot of App Store experiences will promote apps based on how much money they pay. Um, and decentralization, which is really important. So I talked about how anyone can, uh, there's different repositories of applications. There's the official F-Droid one, like you have an official Debian repository, but then you also have arbitrary other repositories. You know, think about PPAs with Ubuntu, where anyone can spin up their own uh, Ubuntu repository. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, F-Droid is a big stack of software, right? It's got a lot of moving parts. Um, these are the ones I'm going to talk most about in this particular talk. Um, so the F-Droid client is those pictures you saw before. It's a thing that goes on the Android phone, um, and it's a thing that allows you to browse apps and search apps and install apps. That's the thing the end user sees uh, when they're doing this. Uh, privileged extension is something that you, you can install on your phone, or some people can install on their phone, uh, which elevates the permissions of F-Droid, so it has the same level of permission as a Google Play Store to install apps, and I'll explain later on why that's important. Uh, F-Droid Server is a set of command line tools for curating your own repositories, so building source code, um, signing packages, uh, producing metadata, and then uploading that metadata to servers. And then we have F-Droid Data and the request for packaging repositories, and this is where we keep all of the build metadata for the open source apps distributed in the official F-Droid repository. Okay, so there's about 2,000 apps or so, and all of the metadata for how to, and the instructions for how to build those apps lives in these, this repository, and you can use in the F-Droid data repository, and you can use the requests for packaging if you want your own app to be packaged. Okay? Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that I probably won't go into any detail today, um, but I encourage you to check them out. So Repo Maker is a you know, graphical front end, and we have a command line client for a desktop computer that you can sideload packages onto your, um, onto your phone, and there's a few other nice things floating around. Um, <clears throat> so with this talk, I want to talk about privacy, security, and freedom. I put those words in the description of the talk because we really care about that at F-Droid. Right? It's not just something that we say. We really, really care about all of these things, um, partially because a lot of people who use F-Droid are people who um, are quite vulnerable. So you think of activists or uh, civil libertarians in countries where the government probably doesn't want you to be an activist. Um, it's kind of important that you protect yourself and your personal devices when you go around and use them. So I wanted to talk about all this stuff. But as I said, there's lots of moving parts in F-Droid. So I sat down, and it doesn't matter what's on this, but I drew the, th the things that I wanted to talk about. And then I started thinking about all the technical security measures we put in to deal with them all. And it wasn't very coherent, linear talk. Um, but what I did come up with is I thought that I'm going to take us through a step-by-step uh, -step from someone who has an app that they want to release on the F-Droid store or the package manager. So how do you go from there to getting your app built, to getting your app released, to allowing users to install it and update it? And at each step of the process, I'm going to highlight some of the security and privacy and freedom aspects to try and give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of um, how we look after the user right, and how we look after your freedoms. So let's start with um, sourcing an application. So someone's an Android developer, they've built an app, and they've released it as open source. 
So here is a GitHub repository of one of my apps, uh, dual license under Apache and, and GPL. So cool, that's uh, open source. I want to get it on F-Droid. So the first step is to go have a look at the inclusion policy for F-Droid, um, which pretty much is be open source, right? Use a, an OSI approved license. Um, where most people fall foul of this is by uh, depending on the Google Play services, which a lot of apps do do. Um, so someone will build an application that uses a Google map, and therefore they depend on the Google Play services, and then they'll license their code as GPL version 3. But it's not compatible with that license because you depend on a proprietary library. So we won't release an app like that. If possible, we'll try and patch out some of those dependencies, but it's a very small team of people. Um, so making sure your app is clear of those sort of dependencies. And the next step, this is a screenshot of somebody else's request, but you come along to the repository and you say, I've got this app, I found it, it the license is good, here's the link to the repository, can you please package it for me? Okay? And then you wait. We've got a pretty small team, right now there's two active maintainers, maybe three active maintainers, so contributions welcome if you want to help out. There's a lot of work to do and not many people doing it. Um, uh, so you wait till someone goes and looks at this issue and says, okay, I'm going to go through my maintainer checklist and then produce some metadata for this application so the F-Droid knows how to build it. Yeah? In the process of doing this, they'll also look at the dependencies and make sure it's not depending on um, any proprietary software. So really super important things in the metadata, like the license, um, but also the repository of where to go get the source code, what Git tag to use to fetch that code, um, and then that goes into the F-Droid metadata repository. Yeah? So we've sourced our application, and we've got some metadata, the other thing a maintainer will do is they'll look for any anti-features. You know, it's a human process, so some might slip through the gaps. But because we care a lot about people's freedoms, um, we'll try and flag apps that have these anti-features. You don't need to read through them all now, but let's take, for instance, um, uh, upstream non-free. So if someone writes a GitHub client, we'll release it just fine, because if it's freely licensed, we're happy to release it. But we'll just notify people that in the absence of a proprietary network service, this app doesn't do anything. Right, so you will actually be depending on a proprietary service. You can choose to install it, that's fine. We won't stop you, but just put little flags up for the end user, which I think is kind of nice. Okay, so we've sourced our application and we've got someone who's collected the metadata for us. And the next stage, and probably the hairiest stage in terms of security, well, maybe not, the network's a little bit worse, but we want to build this package. We want to download the source code and we want to build it. All right, we've got some source code, we want a binary. Um, so this here is a great quote. It's uh, building thousands of apps, especially with automated and or unattended processes, could be considered a dangerous pastime from a security perspective, right? <laughs> yes, it is. We're building thousands of apps and we don't want the build process of one app to interfere with the build process of another app or of the host machine. So every single build is done in a clean VM. The base virtual machine has all of the dependencies to build typical Android apps. Uh, but it is still connected to the internet because each app has different uh, library dependencies that it needs to pull down. So that VM is connected to the internet. Uh, we'll build a, what's called an APK file. That's the binaries that we end up with. And then we'll throw away the VM and spin up a new one for the next app. Okay? So that's good. Um, there's still a few kind of targeted attacks that you can do against a build server environment, and most of them are to do with fetching dependencies. So it's a bit of a weak point right now. So Maven, for those not familiar with the Java world, Maven is kind of like uh, NPM or one of those package managers for a, a, a language environment. Um, 2014, and they weren't serving dependencies over SSL. You had to pay $20 to be part of the package where you could access packages over SSL. And that was a bit dumb, right? So it only took, and this is someone injecting some, that was a blog post before, they managed to inject a, uh, vulnerability into one of the jars in real time as someone requested a package and there were man in the middle in this build machine, right? which is kind of nice. Uh, it got fixed two days later and like, of course, we we're going to put SSL on there, you know, it's fine. Um, but there's still problems with it. I mean, Maven forces all package uploaders, when you upload a, a library there, to sign the package with uh, a PGP key. But there's almost no way to verify that when you're actually downloading the packages. I, I did a search before trying to find out how do you actually use that PGP signature to verify the packages? And it's really, really hard, right? So there's still a bunch of problems with this process. So one of the things that you can do to try and avoid problems around someone attacking the F-Droid build infrastructure, so if someone man in the middle is the F-Droid build machine and manages to insert malicious dependencies or some sort of malicious source code in there, um, what you want is you want what we're calling a, a verification server. And if anyone is at Chris Lamb's talk 
um, yesterday. Uh, he was actually involved in this process, which was uh, you take a, the build infrastructure for F-Droid, and then you build 2,000 apps. And then someone else in the public will, take that, will reproduce that infrastructure and also build those same 2,000 apps and then publish the hashes of all of those binaries. And if lots and lots of people do that, then you can start seeing discrepancies because if somebody has attacked the F-Droid build infrastructure, uh, they'll get different hashes. Uh, the official binaries will have different hashes than everybody else's. So unless all of those verification servers agree, uh, then somewhat, something's a bit awry and we need to investigate. So it's sort of like crowdsourcing the problem of just checking that uh, everything's still okay and we haven't yet, there's no, been no targeted attacks against that build infrastructure. Similar to the SSL observatory as well, if you're familiar with how that works. Um, so we don't actually have uh, that, ver the verification server is set up and it runs, uh, but we don't use that data in the client yet. What would be really cool, and again, contributions welcome, is in the future, uh, the client could check you know, at least three different verification servers and say, I'm only going to install this app if I can verify from three different sources that they've built it in the same way, okay? uh, which would be really, really nice. So the next thing you need to do is you need to sign the package. Okay, so we've got our application, we've built our binary, we've thrown away the virtual machine, um, and then the next step is to sign that package. And the reason is because Android has quite a nice signing, um, signing model in the theme of history repeating. You know, this isn't a new signing model, but the idea is that every time you install a binary on Android, it needs to be signed. You can't install an unsigned binary. Once you install a signed binary, it'll remember the signature of that and the signing certificate. And if you ever try and update that app to a new version of that app uh, and it's signed by somebody differently, it'll just reject it. It won't let you install that, which is really nice. Right? It's a really, really good security feature. Um, the problem with this is that, this is a bit harsh, this isn't necessarily typical, but a common approach for a lot of Android developers who don't think a lot about security um, is that they'll build an app on the same machine that they took to McDonald's that morning to use the open Wi-Fi while they're eating breakfast, and then they'll sign it on the same machine with a certificate that's stored on their unencrypted disk from that machine, perhaps with a weak passphrase. Um, and that's not a particularly good process because you can probably see the problem here that if somebody owns that machine and then takes control of the signing certificate, then they can use that to sign their own malicious versions of the app and then trick people into installing them. So it's not a very good signing process. The way the F-Droid signing process works with our build infrastructure is that you have your build machine, which spins up lots of VMs and builds thousands of apps for F-Droid, but you can do this as a single developer as well. You can build on one machine, then you can take a USB disk and you can physically copy that, uh, that binary to another air-gapped machine, so a machine that's not connected to the network, and then you use that as your signing machine. And you do all of the signing via a hardware security module, so a little USB stick plugged into that air-gapped machine. And what that means is to, to attack this build infrastructure, you need to physically get access to the air-gapped machine, because you can't get there across the network, and you need to get access to the hardware security module, and you need the passphrase. So it's very much you need to go knocking on someone's door. Not impossible. Um, once you've signed it, then you can copy it via USB back to a live machine where you can sync it to a web server. And that's what the F-Droid um, uh, build process is. There's also another signing process that we discussed where if you, people who re, do really actually care about this stuff, they will do something like this, where they'll buy, and this is actually in our documentation on the website, you know, buy a machine with cash, don't ship it across the border, pull out the Wi-Fi hardware, get a verified core boot, install core boot, get a verified Debian, install that, um, and then you've got a pretty safe signing environment. Yeah? But not everybody necessarily needs to do that. You judge your risk profile based on the type of apps you're building. If you're building apps for activists in, uh, you know, repressive regimes, then you probably do want to do something like this. If you're building a little game for your family, then it's probably not as important. So, the other thing with signing packages is when F-Droid builds a package and releases it, it's signed by an F-Droid signing key. And that means that if somebody's come from the Google Play Store and they've installed, uh, let's say, VLC from the Google Play Store, it will have been signed by the VLC developer's signing key. Then if they switch to F-Droid and they've decided they're a bit sick of that Google experience and they want to switch completely to F-Droid, you can't install VLC from F-Droid because it's signed by a different key, right? It's a really good security feature. You can't install to something signed by a different key. Um, you have to uninstall the app and reinstall it again, which VLC, probably not so bad, but if it's your email client or something with a lot of configuration that you spend time setting up, you really don't want to have to do. Um, and the solution to this is very similar to the verification servers, Whoops, but only much more difficult. Um, 
All right, let's start, let me just refresh this page for us. Uh, is reproducible builds. So it's very similar to that, like I said, very similar to the previous service, uh, think, uh, the verification server. If we can take, and, and we actually do do this for F-Droid now, so in that build metadata for an open source app, you say, here's VLC, here's the metadata that F-Droid will use to build the VLC app. And we'll also include a URL to a specific app, the upstream app that was released by VLC, right? That their, their binary signed by them. And during build time, we'll download that app and we'll compare it. We'll actually strip the signature off and we'll strip our signature off and we'll compare the resulting code, the, the binaries, and if they match, then what we'll do is we'll actually, uh, what that means is the thing that VLC released is in fact using the same source code that we use to build the app. Right? There's no other way you can get a byte for byte match with a compiled binary. So we'll take the version signed by VLC and we'll take the version signed by F-Droid and we'll distribute both of them. And what that means is people can switch from Google Play to F-Droid and they can start and they can continue getting updates. Right? They don't have to uninstall. Um, and people who just use F-Droid already can still use the F-Droid signature. Problem is, it's actually a lot harder than the verification server because the verification server, it's our build infrastructure. We're the people who decide how that infrastructure is set up and the VMs that people use, right? It's a very self-contained environment. Whereas here, um, if anyone's ever dealt with reproducible builds before, and, and Chris talked about this in his talk too, um, there's lots of factors that will go into making things not reproducible, like a different operating system or a different time of day, they might insert timestamps in the binary and therefore they're not reproducible anymore. So uh, the only real solution to this is to have upstream build their app using the F-Droid build infrastructure, which probably isn't going to happen with every app anytime soon. Uh, but that's the dream. And this is an example of what the verification server looks like. So we have uh, all of the thousands of apps down the left-hand side, and then you can click on one, and you can see a diff of the contents inside that binary, because the binary is actually a zip file, and inside the zip file there's some bytecode. Um, and you can actually do diffs. In fact, you can't see in this text, but there's got some Java code, um, decompiled Java code in there. Uh, so you can start to identify what you need to do to make these things reproducible. But it's a very, very big effort, and um, it'll take some time. Okay, so we wanted to make that build process and signing process as secure as possible because we really don't want anyone uh, attacking the build infrastructure and therefore tricking us into serving you malicious apps. Right? It's kind of important. You probably expect that. Um, then we talk about the network. So how do we get stuff across the network in a secure way when you're probably in a hostile environment? Uh, not probably. A lot of people are in hostile environments. Um, so all of our metadata is signed. Uh, signed in an air-gapped machine again. Uh, and this is, if you think, of, when I talk about metadata, I'm, now I'm talking about, sorry, a different type of metadata. This is the metadata the client gets, not the build metadata. And it's very much like the metadata that have, uh, if you do an app cache update and you pull down metadata about apps, like descriptions and, and version numbers and so forth, um, that's the type of metadata I'm talking about here. So we'll pull down that type of metadata to the client and we'll only trust that metadata if it's been signed by a particular signing key. And those signing keys are built into F-Droid for at least two repositories, the Guardian project and the F -Droid, main F-Droid repository. So at compile time, we actually have an XML file that specifies what the public key is of that signing certificate. Uh, and then that means that anyone who downloads an official F-Droid build, if you manage to download it on an OK internet connection, I guess, uh, will only trust metadata signed by the F-Droid signing infrastructure. And that's kind of powerful. It's really important because the metadata includes things like what's the hash of all of the binaries? Because before we, once we download an, uh, an app, before we give it to the system to install, we'll verify that the hash is correct. So we didn't get served a malicious app, right? Uh, so it's kind of important that the metadata doesn't get mucked with. Another thing that doesn't exist yet, but hopefully will soon, is individual ROM developers. So at the beginning, we talked about sort of different, almost different distributions that have their own philosophies. Um, if they want to have their own F-Droid repository in the same way that Debian has their Debian repository and Ubuntu has a Ubuntu repository, it would be really nice for um, an Android ROM developer to be able to have something like this. They don't have to install F-Droid, but if they had this sitting on a protected partition in the system partition that's read-only um, and you can't access from user space, then when someone does install F-Droid, we could pick that up and say, oh, let's get the linear JAWS repository, or let's get the replicant repository, or let's get this other ROMs repository. 
And the final way that we deal with this signed metadata is if you're adding a third-party repository to F-Droid. Right? So think about adding a PPA to Ubuntu. If you want to say, hmm, there's a developer over there that's publishing nightly builds or beta versions of their app, and they've got them on their own repository, what we'll do is, and here's an actual real example of uh, one of these developers, they've set up a nightly build repository, and they've got a link to their repository here, and it includes a fingerprint. So fingerprint is a, like a hash of the signing certificate. Um, and when you click that link on Android, it'll say, do you want to open this with F-Droid? Because the URL kind of looks like an F-Droid link. And then it'll open F-Droid, and it'll pre-populate the fingerprint here. And that means that when you save this repository, every time you fetch metadata from that repository, it's going to verify that it's signed by the right signing key. And if it's not, it's going to throw away the metadata. Okay? So no one can give you dodgy metadata in that way. You can leave that blank. If you leave the fingerprint blank, then it falls back to trust on first use. So the first time you fetch some metadata, it'll go, what signing key did you use? Cool. I'm going to store that. And then forevermore, that is a signing certificate that we trust. Um, sure. So that's that part of distribution. Um, the other part of distributing, so that was the security side. The other part we really care about is the freedom side and the privacy side. Right? So we don't want to track what people are doing when they're installing stuff. We have no right to care about what you're installing. It's none of our business. It's not important to us. We don't need it to give you the service that you want. So if you don't need an account, of course, you're not signing up, signing up for an F-Droid account anytime soon. Um, everything's over HTTPS. Uh, we used to pin the certificates in the client, but there's a bug that, that doesn't work, so contribution's welcome. Um, you can, it has first-class support for routing all of the traffic through the Tor network. So you can go to the settings screen in F-Droid and check a box, and it'll route all traffic through the Tor network if you have uh, Orbot, I think it's called, installed, um, so the Android Tor client. Uh, but it also has support for other proxies, so you can say make sure that all the traffic goes through this particular proxy. So you don't have to use Tor, you could use I2P or something like that. Um, so you can sort of choose what level of privacy you want in that regard. The other thing we care about is leaking, uh, leaking information about your habits, your browsing habits, your searching habits, and, and what apps you install. Um, so for instance, language preferences, we do now have internationalized metadata, so when you browse F-Droid, and on your phone you've set your language to Russian, then you'll get Russian screenshots and Russian descriptions, which is kind of nice. Um, but we don't want to tell the server what language you speak. And again, if you think about these high-risk environments, often a high-risk environment with a, a sort of authoritarian regime probably has a smaller population sometimes, and they might speak a specific language, and it becomes a little bit easier to track people from that country that are using F-Droid, and you can watch what apps get downloaded and what don't if you have the capability to do targeted attacks. So we don't want people to know what language uh, you're interested in, so we just send all of the languages. Right? So everyone here who's using F-Droid, the metadata that you're pulling down when it updates, sorry it takes so long, that's why it takes so long, because we have lots of data in there, um, but it's a calculated decision we've made. There's also a bunch of other ways that you can track people um, in a sort of malicious way. Uh, we have a, uh, I believe, TLS sessions. You can insert identifiers from the server in those sessions and use them to track people. Um, so we have an audit, a security audit that's looking into that, and some, amongst other things. And just as, as an example of how you'll track someone, I wanted to take this HTTP e-tags um, solution uh, example. So uh, this cookie-less cookies has actually been around for some time, and if you're not a web developer, what will typically happen is a browser or a HTTP client will say, hey, I want a resource, and then the server will send back a resource and say, here's a hash of the resource. Okay? Next time the client wants that resource, it'll say, hey, I want the resource, and here's the hash from last time you told me. And it'll say, nope, hash is the same, don't worry. Okay? You don't need to download it. Which is good, because it saves bandwidth, you don't need to send the image twice. But it's bad because the server decides what that identifier is, and then the client uses, is sending it back to the server by default. Right? What that means is the server can change the e-tag to Pete's F-Droid connection. And then next time I request something from the server, I don't want to send through Pete's F-Droid connection. It doesn't make sense, because all of a sudden they know I'm requesting certain apps. So what you do is, um, it's a little hard to see the difference between these, but when you request the resource next time, you don't actually request the resource. You say, hey, I want a resource. And it goes, sure, here's a resource, and here's the identifier. And then you say, hey, tell me about this resource. What do you think? What's the identifier? And they'll send back an identifier, and you can make your own decision about whether you should download it again or not. So we've done some little things to make sure that we do the correct behavior here so the server can't track users. We want to put as little trust in 
uh, you want to trust as few people as possible. So we don't want to trust the network. We don't want to trust the server to the extent that we don't want them to track us. Obviously, we need to trust them to give us stuff. Um, but that's an example of F-Droid taking privacy seriously. Um, and one of the other things we do is to have mirrors for repositories. So this is quite common in the typical Linux world, right? Uh, but it's not common in normal app stores. So we don't have mirrors for the F-Droid infrastructure yet because we've got to set up some R-Sync infrastructure. But we do have mirrors for, uh, when I say we, the Guardian project uses all of these different mirrors uh, to serve metadata and apps. And what you'll notice is that some of these servers are really big. Amazon, GitHub. Right? So what they're doing is, this is a beautiful name for this, where they call it collateral freedom, where if a nation state wants to block access to this repository, they need to break Tor, because there's an onion address there. They need to take AWS down. They need to take GitHub down. And they need to take GitLab down. And they need to take the custom server down. So I love that phrase, collateral freedom, around if you want to take this content off and censor it, you need to censor a hell of a lot of stuff, and people are going to notice. Okay? So you can't silently block something like this, which is really nice. Um, the final step of this, so we've talked a bit about distributing, and just let me gather my thoughts. Yep, so we distributed apps securely, and we've distributed, distributed them while respecting your privacy as well, because we don't care about your browsing habits. And the final thing is, how do we securely uh, allow you to download and install an app as an end user? Okay, so we've got this app that lives on the server. We need to bring it to us. We talked about all the network-related stuff. So when you download an app, We'll download it to your phone. We'll hash it and have a look at the checksum, and then we'll compare it to what's in the metadata. Because the metadata is signed, right? if anyone had tampered with that app and sent us a different app, we'll throw it away, because it doesn't match what we expected. So that's the first step. Um, checksums, hash checks, same thing. Um, the other thing is, when we do that hash check, we've got to be really careful not to install it on external storage on Android, because then any app with access to external storage can replace it after we've done the hash check, but before we've requested to install it. Um, so we did a security audit that picked up a bug around that. Um, and now what we do is we download everything into the private F-Droid storage on disk, um, and no other apps have permission to read from that repository. So that causes a few problems, because that's a smaller part of the disk, and it fills up quicker. And it's, it's not ideal from a usability perspective, because your cache will fill up quicker. Uh, but it's really, really important from a security perspective to make sure that no one can tamper with those apps. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with installing apps is uh, most of you, if you've, can I show a show of hands who's installed F-Droid before? OK, so that's probably about 30% of the people. Um, if you've done that, it's quite likely that you've had to enable this thing called unknown sources. I want to talk a little bit about that. So the way Google Play installs apps is magic. Right? It's blessed. It lives on a system partition on the disk. And the Android operating system trusts apps that live on the system partition because it's a read-only partition. Only the ROM developers can put stuff on, the, on that partition. User space applications can't do that. Okay, so uh, the operating system trusts apps on that permission to a higher level, and Google Play lives there. Um, so the way F-Droid does it, because typically we don't live on that partition, there's two ways. There's this thing called Package Manager, which is what most people will probably use. That's what I use. Uh, and then there's this thing called the Privileged Extension. So the Package Manager is part of this Android open source project in the Android framework or runtime. I don't really know. Um, but it, because it's part of the operating system, it has a higher level of permission than a user space app. And this is what it looks like on the left. You might be familiar with this screen. That's not F-Droid showing you that screen. That is F-Droid making a request to Package Manager saying, could you please install this app? Right? And then the system decides if you have permission, if it's going to display that dialog or not. Uh, and then this is, uh, that user interface you're looking at is actually from the Package Manager from the Android system. It's not from F-Droid. It's actually quite clever. It will do things. Uh, some people install apps that draw over the top of the screen. So if you think about like a red shift or something that changes the color of the screen at nighttime, um, if you have permission to draw over the top of the screen, you can draw arbitrary permissions over here, or you can remove permissions from here. So the Android system will actually disable the install button if it detects that there's an app running that can draw over the top of the screen. It took us a while to figure out why people were complaining that they couldn't install apps. But it's actually really clever. I really liked it. Um, that doesn't work out of the box with F-Droid. If you go to the F-Droid website and download F-Droid, you're going to get a big, fat, install-blocked message. 
and it's going to say, for security, your phone is set to block installations of apps obtained from unknown sources, which is a euphemism for not Google Play. Um, you, helpfully, it gives you a way to get to settings, check this box, which rightfully so is scary because all of a sudden you're allowing the Bluetooth app and the browser app and Facebook and messaging apps to have permission to request apps be installed by Package Manager, which is kind of scary, but you need it for Android to work. It got a little better on later versions of Android now, so you can actually say, I want to download Android, and it'll say, Chrome doesn't have permission to install apps. So you say, OK, Chrome, you have permission to install apps. Can you please install let me? Can you send a request to install Android? And he says, sure, no worries. And then once you've installed Android and you try and install an app, it'll say, Android doesn't have permission to install apps. Do you want to grant permission? And you say, yes, Android can have permission to request apps be installed by Package Manager. So you've narrowed down the list of apps that can uh, do malicious things. Uh, please remember to go back and uncheck Chrome once you've done this process, because otherwise you still have a browser that can send install requests, which is kind of scary. So this is not ideal. Right? So some effort was put in by a few different people to build what was called what eventually became the privileged extension. And the privileged extension is a very small application, just a stub, and it only has one role. And its role is to live on the system partition where it gets elevated permissions, and it receives install requests from, Android, uh, from F-Droid, and then it installs apps. So it's exactly like Package Manager, except it only accepts requests from F-Droid. What it does is it says, who sent me that install request? And then it goes and it sees that, um, that it was the F-Droid package. And then it has a look at who signed the F-Droid package. Is it the same key that signed me, the privileged extension? And if it was, then it allows the install to go ahead. Um, and that means that by having this stub application on your uh, system partition, you get those elevated permissions, but you don't have unknown sources checked, which is really cool. The other thing, the reason we kept it really small is because we want people to be able to audit the code really easily because it's highly sensitive to put something like this on your root petition. And we want to encourage ROM, de ROM developers to include this in their ROMs. So even if they don't want to include F-Droid, because if you ever had like a new Android phone from Optus or Telstra and it's got a million apps that you can't remove because they're on the system petition, it would be annoying if you couldn't uninstall F-Droid. Um, but this, is, this isn't an app that appears in your list of apps. This is something, it's a system thing that floats around until you finally install F-Droid, it will just magically start using this system, which is kind of nice. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about um, in terms of security and privacy, all the way through the process of taking an application where we care a lot about the freedom and the open source and we care a lot about signing things correctly. We care a lot about distributing things safely. We care about not trusting networks. We care about not trusting web servers with regards to tracking. So we put a lot of thought into this. Um, like I said, though, it's not new. I mean, this is, this is the theme of the conference, is history repeating. And, and we're kind of rebuilding the infrastructure that already exists. But that's just because we, you know, it started as a small project and grew organically uh, to where it is now. So I would encourage you to start thinking about your Android phone as less of a thing that you have for one year running something that was given to you by Google or by your provider and think about it more like a device that you own, that you're in control of, that you can install apps safely and in a secure manner. And yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to come here to talk about. Thanks for listening. Got uh, two minutes for questions. If anyone's got any questions, sure. Is there any work to make Ftroid Server less difficult for sysadmins? Yes, always. But if you have any specific concerns, please do please do jump on the issue tracker because there's an active group of people working on Ftroid Server, including people who currently so Easy on Droid is another Ftroid repository that distributes binaries of free software. Um, and Izzy is coming along and helping out and saying, hey, I actually use this tool and here's some pain points I have. Let's work through them. So, yeah, one-liner. When F-Droid server is killed by a dodgy app, spit out the package name so you can tell where you're up to. Cool. I'd love to have a chat to you later about what you're using F-Droid server for. Please do come down and have a chat after. Thanks. Got time for another question? I had a question. Who funds F-Droid? So it's been a volunteer project based on donations for a long time. Yep. Uh, some of the features you saw in there were paid for by grants. So there was two grants pretty much. One grant for um, 
$30,000 or something for this, that mini app store experience on the phone. So that was from a group that wanted to share apps uh, around. Another much bigger grant from the Open Technology Fund, which is a group in the US that funds projects that help keep the internet free and open. Um, and there's another group called Viento right now. I think it's a European group who's also had a grant um, to help develop the security side of F-Droid as well. Um, but primarily, predominantly, it's a volunteer project driven by donations. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks mm -hmm. for that. And here's a present for us. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thank you.